Well, hi everyone. I uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, we're ready to go with today's IMI webinar. Um, and it's great to have uh, so many of you with us today. Our topic is MOT assessments in 2021, how they've changed and how to pass. And we've got an awesome foursome, as you can see, uh, of experts who are going to share their knowledge uh, and tips and answer your questions. Um, just so as you know, I'm, my name's Matthew Rock. I work on the IMI's fantastic members magazine called MotorPro. Uh, I'm just going to be your host for today and help the team to uh, get your questions and pass on their knowledge. Um, so time to meet our panel. Um, why don't you put your cameras on, guys? Let's have a look at you. Um, so we've got uh, uh, we've got from the IMI uh, the uh, MOT guru there, Graham Allen. The IMI, as you probably know, is one of only two approved EVSA partners. Um, uh, so good to see you, Graham. Uh, we've also got no less than two people from the DVSA with us today, which is great. So uh, thank you to uh, to Chris and uh, Simon for joining us. Really good to have you with us. We really appreciate it. And then last but not least, um, we've got Roy Prosser from, Con from Krypton with us. Uh, Roy, Roy is uh, himself, like in fact all four of our guests today, is a uh, one-time qualified tester and technician. So, uh, so we, uh, we've got a lot of knowledge in the house. So good to have you all with us and uh, thanks for being with us today. Um, Quick word on the format. What we're going to do, the four of us, is have a little bit of a chat. I'm going to ask uh, each of the uh, the team to share some tips and uh, let you know about the state of the market at the moment. There are a lot of questions, obviously, about with extensions, with COVID, with uh, new pass rates for the uh, MOT assessment. A lot of questions out there, and we hope we'll be able to answer all of those. Um, then after we've had a bit of a chat, we're going to take your questions uh, at, at, towards the end. But if you do have some questions, though, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the, the Q&A tab during the conversation. And if some come up that we want to tackle straight away, then we'll do that. Just uh, I hope it's easy for you to understand the, the Q&A uh, button there. Type in your questions. We'll keep an eye on those. And, uh, and uh, I hope that's straightforward for you. I should say that this webinar is going to be uh, available afterwards. So if you have any technical issues or anything like that, then we'll share it out afterwards and we can take further questions um, afterwards as well. So anyway, we're going to start off, but we're going to start off, I think, with a poll. Um, we just want to understand the, uh, the state of play among the, uh, the, the guests with us today. So. Georgia in the background is uh, going to launch the poll, I hope. Georgia, are we good to go with that? Great, thank you. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, putting in your answer to the question, which of the following is the main reason you haven't taken your annual assessment yet? Um, please be honest with us. Uh, it's all anonymous, so we won't, we won't know who's filled in which. Uh, too busy with other work and not had time. There's still plenty of time before the deadline too busy with backlog of MOTs because of last year's MOT extension or concerned that I might not pass. So uh, I think what we're going to do is to leave that, uh, if you could put your, uh, put your uh, answers in now, but I think we're going to leave that one live as well, just for a few minutes. Anyway, uh, let's crack on. Um, we've got a number of discussion points, which you can see up on the slide. And the first one, I'm going to ask uh, Graham Allen from the IMI to, to take this one, which is why it's so important to complete your training and assessment before the deadline. Human nature, you know, we all like to leave things to the last minute, but uh, Graham, over to you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, the short answer, uh, and I really hope this isn't a surprise to anybody uh, on this session today, but the short answer is that not completing by the deadline will result in the tester having their tester status suspended. Now, inevitably, that could lead to some uncomfortable conversations the following day in the garage as you frantically try to reschedule customers' MOTs that have been booked in, but you don't currently have uh, a, 
a tester there to facilitate. Um, so that's that's the bottom line, really. It, it's it's suspension of that MOT tester's status. Probably also worth pointing out, actually, that regaining that lost status is not necessarily an overnight process. So the suspended tester will now need to complete the new year's uh, training and assessment. So now we'll be talking about the 2021 stroke 22 year. Uh, and they could also be subject to a demonstration test with the DVSA. Um, so as you can see, it's not, it's not an overnight process. The implications of not completing on time could potentially be, be kind of longer lasting than, than, than many might think if they've not been in that position before. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the consequences covered, but um, I think this session is more about, more about providing advice, guidance, solutions, as much as anything else. So, um, you know, hopefully we can get on and talk about more of the, more of the, the positive issues, but it's important to understand the, the, the consequences of not completing on time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Graham. I mean, in terms of the, uh, you know, we all do it. It is, like I said before, it is human nature to uh, to sometimes leave things um, to the end. But do you have any, um, you know, maybe thinking about your own CPD and your own personal training and development, do you have any tips that you want to share? I'll come to you, uh, maybe uh, uh, Chris next on this, but any tips that you'd like to share on, you know, how best as an individual to keep up your 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 training? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, I mean, yeah, Graham's right. It's the, the, ultimately, the, the uh, you know we can switch people off from testing it, then they're training on time. The the aspiration for training is always that it's done early and people learn from it. So we don't want people really leaving it to the last minute to train because you don't train the best then. You don't learn the best. You're trying to you're just trying to pass the assessment as quickly as you can what we will want to try and drive is having that continued professional development throughout the year. And you are learning throughout the year. And that's either by you reading books, manuals, guides, or taking up <clears throat> um, courses and, and alike. So when you come to annual assessment, it's not difficult. It should be a fairly easy thing to pass and you've got the knowledge. Um, so yeah, and it is easy to say, sit, me, his, me sit here and say, yes, you should do your training well in time. And we all know everyone doesn't, but we're at the DVSA, we have structured time. I know that we're probably a bit different. We get given time allocated for training out of our day to go and do training. Mm. Um, and it's things like that that I think, you know, we, we want to try and adopt in garages as well. So whereas you might get trained on products, i.e. The, the product you're working on, be it a, whatever manufacturer or new system, I think MOT needs to be thought of in the same remit. So in the modules for MOT and all the things that go with MOT, it's, it's keeping your skill set high whether it's MOT testing, whether it's servicing, whether it's mass tech, all those sort of things, should we trying to get MOT thought of on the, on the same sort of level? So you don't have these shocks at the end of the year. So this this time frame, this you know, the end of the 30th of April is looming. It's not a thing that's looming. You've just done it. So the yeah. training's in the box and you've learned and you're a you're a better tester technician for it as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, that'll be my kind of tips really, is just to try and factor it into your yearly, your yearly learning about being a technician and MOT another 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 string to your bow of being a technician isn't it it's not yeah. the whole thing. graham anything you want to add yeah i mean again this 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 shouldn't be news to anybody here i mean you can see it on your screen there you know dvsa have extended the annual deadline this year as you can see 30th of april uh imi fully supports this decision um uh, you know the our industry has been has been hit hard uh by the pandemic this year and and MOT testers are still servicing the backlog of MOTs as the, as the general public utilised that, that extension last year. Again, absolutely the right thing to do. Um, so giving testers a little bit more breathing space to complete this year is, is absolutely right. Um, that said, you know, the reality is the training and assessment does still need to be, need to be completed on time. Um, our recommendation really would be to try and break it up, do it bit by bit. You know, this, that three hours of training, break it down into manageable sessions. So you're not trying to, you're not presenting yourself with the, you know, with the challenge of, of, of the training and the assessment after a hard day's work on that, on that final deadline day. Um, so yeah, bre breaking it down, I think would be, would be a good piece of advice there. 
it's Excellent. good to as well, isn't it? It's good, you know, you're all in this together. So technicians, they're all, they're all in this together, they're all testers. You know, any any areas you're sort of like struggling on in on the annual assessment or on the on the training, you know, have those discussions over a cup of tea with your peers in the workshop is is mm. good ways to learn. Um, yeah, I mean, you quite often find on most training courses you go on the the conversations you have at break times or in the evenings are probably the, the where you learn quite a lot of stuff actually. So having those conversations with your yeah, counterparts, your peers in your garage, about, about areas of the MOT or anything actually that you're not sure of is, is good. And if you still don't know, I think it's then it's time to to seek th further advice and reach out to the likes of IMI for, for training, etc. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a good moment to move on to the sort of second point that we've got is the uh, discussion points um, there, Chris. But I mean, uh, and this this really is one for you, I think, is, you know, how has the assessment and the test changed this year? Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about this and the, you know, the new higher pass rate and different things thrown into the assessment. Can you just give us, a you know, your quick heads up on that? Yeah, so the, it was always pl planned to, to evolve. And we've been very clear on that from, from the start when when it was it's kind of outsourced, if you like. So the, the, the annual assessment was, was always quite a low pass mark. and We've always been quite clear how it's going to track up to be a bit harder if you like um and it needs to evolve we need to bring in new things the test doesn't stay still of course does it it changes so in 2018 there was the big eu directive we came in lots of new um failures and, and fail criteria that came into the test so it needs to evolve to, to marry to marry in that we've always wanted to broaden it as well across to not just testing vehicles the broad spectrum of moting so a little bit running the garage understanding how mm -hmm. to issue issue duplicates, replacements, the kind of rules around that and emergency testing, that sort of thing. So we wanted to, always wanted to broaden it and we'll continue to broaden it actually into it. it the test has got this broad knowledge of, of testing, so it does evolve. So um, yes, it is a bit harder. I admit it's a bit harder, but it's nothing that's not there in the guide of the manual. It's no, there's no hidden things in this. It's all stuff that, that people learn and should know actually. So, um, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think if you do put the, put the the effort in and training it's it's easily passable as well so um yeah can i i was going to bring roy, thanks chris i was going to bring roy here in at this point because i know roy you keep a close eye on the you know the tester forums and you know you hear the chat that's going on yep. what are some of the things that that you see that people are concerned about um it is very much about i, I think the concerns are Obviously, there's this thing of if I don't pass, I've got to stop testing. So I've got to pass. And it, it feels very, you pick up from a lot of people that it's very pressurized. Um, but in all walks of life, if you don't pass stuff, you can't carry on doing it. Um, certainly, I think as um, people are getting concerned about things changing and on some of the forums you'll get, you know, and it's not a always asking for advice, but it's asking for opinions on, you know, what is now a suitably welded component and what is not a suitably welded component and stuff like that that's going to come up in the assessment. And certainly, going back to Chris's point about um, the broader things of testing, categories of vehicles, um, the, the what is a class four and what is a class seven and where does a dual purpose vehicle at 3.2 kilos come in and well sorry 3200 kilos come in if it's got a second row of seats that seems to be the stuff that's really causing the confusion from what i pick up anyway right thanks roy i mean uh, uh, graham do you, are you hearing similar things yeah so certainly around the, around the the broader spectrum of it, it's not just about testers completing a test as, as Chris said it's about the issuing of documents but that that is all laid out in the in the training syllabus each year isn't it so as Chris said there's no there shouldn't be any hidden surprises in there it's not designed to catch anybody out the syllabus each year outlines what is expected of a tester to to know and understand um Picking right. up on the comment now, I should just uh, remind if you've just joined us in the last few minutes that we are running a poll um, just to find out about where you are in terms of your own assessment. So if you haven't filled out the poll, um, you know, please do. And uh, that'd be very helpful. And we'll share the results uh, at, at the end. Um, I mean, just sort of moving things along. And like I say, please do put any questions that you have specifically about the changes to the assessment 
or any concerns that you've got or questions that you've got uh, about the topics raised, uh, put them in the Q&A chat and we'll, um, we'll the Q&A button and we'll try and take those in the, in a second. Um, I mean, I'm going to come back to you, Roy, but um, and then but all of you are on this one, really. Um, I mean, I think that there is a it strikes me and I'm not a uh, qualified uh, technician or tester, but it strikes me that there, the 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 MOT can get sort of um, fenced off as just you know a, a, a an obligation the assessment an obligation in itself, but actually the process is helpful um, on on a wider level to the business and to yourself, isn't it? I mean, um, and it, it, you can it's a way in a, uh, for many garages it's a way of marketing it's an, it's a sort of way in with new customers so roy any thoughts on this yeah um certainly as people have been using their vehicles less during the lockdown period as people have for a lot of people their incomes have been reduced uh, during the time um servicing is the first thing that always goes and it it's, it's, I suppose, been the same as long as I've been in the industry. It's the thing that people skip on because until something breaks, you just kind of ignore it. Whereas the annual check of if the vehicle's safe, it has to be done if you want to carry on using the vehicle. So people will still look around, book an MOT. And it is that time where it's a case of passing or failing the vehicle, advising if things are right. But it is a way that garages are picking up work. Because if people haven't had it serviced, um, and I think one of the things I've picked up, coil springs, there seems to be an increase in breakages, whether it's just people are commenting on it more. But it's that stuff that's not getting picked up on service, but is getting picked up on test. So it, it is a way of, you know, the garage is carrying on bringing vehicles in for repair, as well as the annual test. Great. Now, um I don't know whether it's only me. We've got a, you, the lines dropping a bit in and out with you, Roy. So I don't know whether there's anything your side you can um, do to enhance it, or we'll take a look in the background. But I want to. Uh, what if you just, if you don't mind having a look, um, I'll okay. put that question over to to you, Graham, as well. Can you, and then um, uh, Chris as well, if you want to answer it. But you know. How do you see the benefits of the of the uh, the whole assessment process on a wider level? Well, I mean the the the, the, the fundamental point of, of CPD or any or any training is 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 to keep people keep people current, you know. And 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 here at the IMI, we're all about driving uh, driving professional standards and 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 professional development of our people. So you know, it's it's absolutely fundamental to to to, to, to what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and you know, the, the rate with which technology on these vehicles is evolving is, is phenomenal. So it's only right that the MOT evolves with it and therefore the testers carrying out those MOTs need to be kept current. So it's, 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 a, it's an ongoing cycle, isn't it? Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, as, as Roy quite, quite rightly put out, uh, the, the, some garages may be experiencing a downturn in their regular servicing activity, but one thing that won't go away is is the MOT. Quite rightly, you know, if if, if vehicles aren't being serviced or maintained as correctly as they should be, the the MOT is the final kind of um, stopping point, isn't it? That's going to pick up um, additional work for for garages. Yeah. Um... It's interesting uh, of the uh, the poll that we're running. Um, I'm told that of the uh, we've had 28 uh, answers, and 13 of those um, are saying that they're uh, people are um, uh, no seven are saying that they uh, are concerned that they might not pass it. So there might be a bit of a a confidence issue yeah. out there because of the changes that there have been to the yeah. assessment. And, and I completely understand that. I mean, I'm not a big fan of uh, assessments myself. I mean, not many people are. Uh, and, and with an 80% pass rate uh, now, it's understandable that there could be some instances of uh, you know, not achieving that pass rate on the first go. Um, my point there would be all the more reason to try and do it earlier rather than later so that you've still got some time 
to come back and retake. If you're doing it on the last day, which we see, we see it every year, um, you, you see people logging in the evening of, of the final day on deadline day, so to speak. Um, if you don't pass it on that on that one go, you, you've yeah. kind of left yourself a bit short. So again, all the more reason to, to, to start the process early. Yeah, yeah. Chris, I gotta get, uh, Chris, I'll come to you on this, but I also want you to think about coming up on the questions a couple of points about why the assessment is time limited which you know uh give you a chance to think about that but uh, sorry back to you chris no i was going to say i think you know the, the, the that's the point of you know the fear that people might fail it i think you know it shouldn't be a fear that you're going to fail it it's kind of okay to fail it we learn more when we fail things don't we because then you go and learn it and the idea being is you like graham said if you do, if you do it in time you can go away and you can see the things you've failed on and research those and come back stronger and pass it. So that whole learning cycle is in work is, is in working very well. Um, you know, back to the point that Roy made earlier about, you know, this sort of people are fearful about, you know, the, which class of vehicle should I test, all those sort of questions in there. Inevitably, those questions always come up at the wrong time in life. So it's always when you're on your own in the garage and that vehicle turns up and you don't know, quite know whether it's whether I can test it or I can't test it. So that's the purpose of training. The purpose of having quite a tough assessment is so that sticks in your mind. You remember, ah, okay, that's a that's a class so and so. I can test that, or I can't test it. So you know those things when the chips are down, because that's when it's that's when it counts, and that's the whole purpose of training, isn't it? To get to make ourselves better. So um, yeah, but I mean, back to the point of of, of timing. Um, if if it was unlimited time, it, you know, you could you could go away and research it for hours and hours and hours. So we need a we do need a time limit on on the assessment. There's always a kind of a, a, a time limit on on assessments. Um, to, to focus the mind really and I think you know it's 30 questions in an hour it's it's entirely doable it's not um beyond the wit of man to do you know a question every couple of minutes um it's, and it's, sorry Chris for interrupting but particularly if 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 the testers have done the training the CPD as well you know exactly yeah and you know it's we, 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 we wholly encourage you to have the manual guide with you at the same time when you're doing the doing the training so you can look things up as you go through as well so I think I think the hour is 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 enough personally yeah i mean there are there are some and i'm sure this is under review and maybe you can clarify constant review because a couple of comments about you know some questions being uh lee saying um some the questions are awkwardly worded um and therefore that takes up time in the assessment you know it, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I've lost it, you, Matthew. Yeah, I lost Matthew then, yeah. <clears throat> oh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, it's about the, if you um, have a look at Lee's question about the awkward, you know, uh, is, the, is the wording of some of the questions under constant review? Well, yeah, some might want to chip in on that one. But yeah, the questions are all, I mean, they're reviewed every year. We're always reviewing the questions and, and changing them to, to and then make them fit. And if any questions are, that we feel, feel that are, are awkward or, been misunderstood so we see that the same questions being failed a lot then we can tweak it but um they are reviewed by us and by all the awarding organizations to ensure the questions are fair and and well understood though Chris can I can I ask a question on that on that subject and and excuse my 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 ignorance here do do testers have the opportunity to feed back on that sort of thing not directly no no they no, don't it might be it might be a good thing to have actually some of the questions that you know if the if the question is misunderstood or misleading in some ways yeah we could have a feedback but I guess that'll be via via yourselves and then through to us actually yeah that's the way that's the way it currently works that train with various feedback to this <laughs> and then the meetings that we have with the audit award and I guess awarding organizations feedback to us with any concerns they have. I know the question there is uh, have the questions changed when the uh, manuals changed? Uh, the answer to that is yes, when we put the update out and there were some RFRs changed last month, the questions were amended or removed from the from the panel of questions that were no longer relevant. So we do constantly review and remo remove the questions that are, that are no longer relevant to the guide when we, on the manual when we make changes. So that should cover that one off. And of course, in, in, in relation to the, um, the topics Covered, uh, you know, via the via the syllabus each year and via the via the assessment questions. Um, Chris, Simon, I think I'm right in saying you, you you take that as an opportunity to 
to, to analyze the, the data from the previous year. So where have testers struggled, uh, you know, common, uh, common themes that you've seen throughout the year and you kind of build that into your syllabus for the following year, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we set, we set the standards in the syllabus regarding the feedback we get back from our enforcement examiners who do re-inspections and find things that have been done wrong on tests, headline theme being one that's always been there for years upon years, uh, and feedback from training providers and, and our call centre where the call centre receives many questions of how do a test will ring up, how do we do this, how do we do that. They also feed back to us where, where we feel there's a training need there for, for shortcomings that we get or questions asked through, through our contact centre. Just um, answering Lee's question actually a bit further down around uh, sort of the evolution of the training. Are we looking at bringing other roles in, i.e. ADM? Yes. Yes, we are. So we're looking at, um, it may be a way off yet, Lee, but um, we do want to make the ADM and site managers a bit more accountable actually for, for training. So um, it's on our radar. I wouldn't say it's coming anytime soon. Yes, we would like to bring, we would like to, to bring in more roles into, into training, definitely. Um, and just back to Simon's point then about the, the about what the way the questions are at the minute, I would it'll be difficult, but I would like to get to a position where the where the questions are more tailored to individuals, and that would involve a lot of data collection. But you know, trying to understand where an individual is struggling or may need a training need would be better, um, rather than it being a bit of a blunt tool like it is today and, and having the you know standardized question pack, if you like. It would be nice to have you know, if we knew a, a tester or, or whoever was struggling in a particular area of the test whatever that may be, um, we could have some more questions around that or some more training around that area so that person improves. Um, and that could be from things we've gained from data, it could be things we've gained from feedback from our examiners or even enforcement to try and improve that person. But I would like this, I would like to evolve the training and the, the annual assessment to be a bit more, a bit smarter if you like in those areas. And that could be even that the, the, the site manager or the, or the, uh, you know, the, the quality control in the garage could could even choose, if you like, different questions and different training for that individual through the annual assessment as well. So they might see a training need in the garage for certain of their uh, testers, and they might choose to, to either send them on the course or choose a type of a type of annual assessment they want them to sit, actually. Yeah. Interesting. That's definitely the way a lot of training and assessment is going, isn't it? Much more personalised, but a little way off, you reckon? Well, yeah, it's about gathering data, really, and, and having the having the vehicle to do it. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of aspirations. But, yeah, getting there is always a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sorry if my uh, connection has been a bit uh, iffy uh, for the last few minutes. Um, I wanted to bring Roy, because we haven't heard from you for a couple of minutes, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that the, uh, the sound is back on. Anything you wanted to add at this point? Um, no, I can't. I did want to ask a question, though, across to... Um... Please do. Yes, I really. Um, and it's as the new technologies come in, so as newer items, newer technologies are added into the test, will the training specifically follow on with that or to, not having done the training? Um, does the training specifically follow those technology trends as well? Yeah, the simple answer, it, it should do. So training should always follow the, what's, what the vehicle park is like today. I presume, I presume you're talking about vehicles, but that, particularly Roy. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, vehicles are advancing really quickly. I was on a call this morning around, around autonomous vehicles and the rest of it. And actually it's quite scary, the amount of things that are changing on cars and how rapidly it's changing. Um, so yeah, and the MOT at some point is always, MOT is naturally always a little bit behind the curve. And that's kind of right, I think, that we're a little bit behind uh, proper futures because it's the way the vehicle park comes into into servicing and into the MOT being three years, of course. So um, that makes sense. Um, but yes, training and and the MOT itself has always needs to keep pace with tech and modern vehicles. So um, when we're training people to be testers in the, if in the first instance and then continued improvement, we need to make sure that, that the questions are relevant to the vehicles you're testing, actually. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, on that note, I'm just looking at the um, assessment topics for for next year so just to be clear next year not not anyone uh, listening to know this for this year uh, and some of them include you know lighting systems as, as simon mentioned earlier multiple function lamps um, electric and hybrid and hydrogen powered vehicles uh, fly-by-wire steering systems carbon fiber components so absolutely yeah evolving with the with the technology yeah we've got it seems to me as an, an outsider on this that there's sort of 
very different trends. So we've got the the existing and and likely to be the case over the next few years. We've got the the existing car park getting older, you know, and people hanging on to vehicles for longer. And then we've got a lot of very advanced new vehicles with new systems entering into the market. So it's sort of it's going to become more complicated for um, a lot of um, testers. Is that is that a fair analysis, Chris? I think w w without without the due care and, and diligence of the annual uh, training, yes, absolutely. But that's what the training. Sorry yeah. for speaking for you, Chris. But but that's that's what the training is all about. That's what it's designed to support the testers with. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, it, my uh, Wi-Fi had a little wobble then. So oh uh, no, that's all right, uh, Chris. I was saying that the um, we've got on the roads today. We've got a lot of vehicles that are getting older, and people are hanging on to vehicles for longer. But at the same time, we've got new vehicles coming onto the roads that are quantum difference to the uh, to the the older ones. So. We've got it's sort of more complex for testers in in how that in how they kind of you know build the capability to service you know very different vehicles. Yeah, I think there's always been that that gap, isn't there, about new tech coming in and older vehicles. Actually, I think you're probably right. It is probably advancing a bit quicker now than it has done in in recent years. But it's always been that there's always been that kind of breadth of knowledge required for a tester from testing you know a classic car. Well, up to the, to the newest one, there's always, and that, that will always be the same going forward, actually. So I think it's it's, a, it's about keeping yourself current, isn't it, on, on new tech, really. Um, you yeah. know, and vehicles have enough tyres, they can have wheel bearings, they can have suspension. So the fundamentals are going to be the same. It's just some of the tech that's driving it is going to be quite different from going forward. Yeah. I want to, um, we're going to keep on with, because there's some good comments. Thank you, everyone, for your comments, Nigel and Wayne and Lee. Um, I mean, there are, you know, uh, and I think you can see these for yourselves. You know, Nigel's saying that if the assessment has to be time limited, then make it longer because, you know, a number of people, uh, certain people can, who aren't tech savvy, can, you know, struggle with that. Um, but I'm interested, Lee makes a point, we have testers that struggle with dyslexia and other learning difficulties and therefore require a bit of additional support, such as extra time. I mean, these are difficult uh, issues and, you know, quite specific issues, but I'd be, I'd be interested to get the panel's thoughts on this one. We were discussing that actually last week, we have a, a, all the training providers get together and they were discussing this very issue actually. So um, yeah, I mean, there is, there's quite a lot of plugins. So you can have screen readers that will read questions to you and help with dyslexia quite a lot. So we know in DVSA, we've done quite a lot of research into, into dyslexia. We do know that there's, you know, the more people that slightly suffer of dyslexia in the motor industry um, anyway. So we've been looking at ways to improve our manuals and guides so that they can be more spoken word and diagrammatical rather than um, <clears throat> just textual all the time. So yeah, there's, there's, there is plugins you can use to, to read questions to people uh, and help. Um, and you can have people next to you to read the question to you and help as well, um, if, if need be. They can't help with the others, but they can help you with the reading and understanding. Um, and it was it was widely agreed at, uh, at the meeting that that's that's acceptable to do so as long as the person is not, you know, taking the assessment for that person. They are purely helping with, with reading and and alike. So there's there's ways and means to help out with this, uh, and there always will be. So um, we're fully on board with that as well. Yeah, very good. Graham, any uh, or Roy, any further thoughts on um, that? Only something that came up in a, a pre conversation really about the use of tablets and the use of maybe PCs with where it's easier to have tabs open on a PC than a tablet and that, that might be worth something worth people considering. Great. Yeah Graham. I, haven't, I, I haven't really got anything other than, 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 what, than what Chris has said but again another, another excellent point from, from Roy there we have had feedback where where people have said it's much easier to navigate this on a on a laptop or on a desktop um, rather than rather than the tablet. Whilst it is accessible on a tablet or even a phone, um, it can be much easier to navigate on a laptop or a desktop. Um, I understand that we've got uh, the poll results through, so it might be a good, a nice moment. We're going, going to take some more questions for another five, 10 minutes or so, but um, 
uh, it might be interesting for you to see the, uh, the poll results. So here we are. We asked you, this is like a, getting like a proper game show now, um, which is the main reason you haven't taken your annual assessment yet. Um, 27% too busy with other work and haven't had time. Uh, 20% still plenty of time before the deadline. Uh, too busy with backlog of MOTs because of last year's MOT extension, zero. And con concerned I might not pass, uh, 53%. So yeah, I mean, we, we've discussed this, but there is there are concerns obviously out there about, uh, any, any quick responses on that one, guys? I just wonder what the fear is. I know, you know, <clears throat> what the fear is of failure. Failure. I guess that, you know, if you're leaving at the last minute, I understand that. But um, like we've been saying all the way through this about, you know, continual learning. Um, if you do fail it, I know it's time out of your day and you've got to do it again. <clears throat> but, you know, and, and how, how do people perceive they're going to mitigate that failure? So what they're going to do to prepare better to not have that failure? So I, I, I wonder what the, where the fear is driven, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a small sample, but you know, um, it's it's the guess we have with us today. Yeah, really interesting, Chris. That the last year's extension to MOT appears, based on this sample, to have no impact as the bearing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? That I think for the last sort of five minutes or so, I just wanted to make sure that we cover off um, point. Five, I think it is on our on our discussion points about where is the MOT headed, and we've we've touched on this a little bit in terms of you know the more advanced vehicles, and new systems coming into the uh, onto the roads. But I mean, there are other um, changes afoot in terms of people and training and the equipment required. Um, Roy, can I just come to you on this one because obviously you know you're very engaged with the uh, the equipment that uh, that garages need. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it will be interesting as we get into testing more safety systems, the the ADAS type systems, because that's something that is going to require more specialist kit. Um, as emissions get tightened, um, we know that Europe are tightening up their emissions legislation, so it'll be interesting to see again if we follow that type of trend here. I think the most interesting thing will be when an autonomous vehicle drives itself in for its MOT, though and there's no one to hand you the keys because it just parks itself in a bay and waits for you. But um, certainly that's where the training is going to be. People are going to need to keep up with the, the technologies to be able to test. Yeah. And there's a question, I think a lot of, uh, you know, people who are going to, having to invest in this, the new, in new equipment are going to be asked about, you know, which is the which is the pro, where are the priorities in terms of investment in new in new equipment? I mean, any thoughts on that, Roy? And then over to you, uh, Graham and Chris as well. Um, my from an equipment manufacturer, I think they should replace everything now. But <laughs> being pragmatic about it, I actually think the idea of like the MTS, the connected side of things making that not a sweeping initial you must go connected now but making it a you need to go connected when you next change equipment i think that's where people who have got existing bays if they don't need to make sudden changes just make sure when they are going forward to make sure that they buy up-to-date equipment that can meet what's going to be required and also be looking ahead at what might need to be connected in the future um don't be buying stuff now that can't be connected if you know in two years time connected to likely to be a, a situation yeah interesting graham chris any thoughts on this yeah chris, well, I think you're probably better placed to, to to comment on this than than i am yeah if you like but yeah I mean, our, our journey we've been quite clear actually where we are on connected equipment and and our our journey to kind of evolve the, the test if you like so we've you know we've got um Diesel monitors, brake testers are connected now. We'll very soon be launching, uh, I think April, May, depending on how we get on with uh, development. Um, connected emissions machines will come to the fore and they'll be mandated around about yeah, late spring this year. Um, and then after that, we'll be moving on to, uh, to headlight testers. So that'll be all the all the main bits of kit in the test lane will be be connected then and be able to transfer data automatically. I've always been trying to, we've always been a bit cautious about doing this and trying to work with manufacturers to 
to understand you know how the bits of kit can be evolved it can be software upgrades can be added to these machines to make them connectable it's not always having to buy new i know roy won't like hearing this but um so you, they, they can be upgraded um and it's evolution so when that kit breaks you can put it in if there's a new a brand new test station, yes, they have to be connected or a takeover of an existing test station with a new AE, then we push connected. But um, we're not forcing the industry to, to invest heavily at the minute. Um, it's, a, it's a slow burn to, to graduate this connected equipment into the test lane. The next big things for us really, which is you know trying to baby steps into modernizing the test really is, is looking at starting to connect to vehicles. Uh, and that does start touching on where we, where, where we are with autonomy and and that's the things. Um, and then looking at cameras, so bringing in some sort of camera into the test lane is something we've been working on for about a year now. Um, and that's primarily to help with registration of tests. Um, we have a lot of errors created by tests and testers, um, more often than not just by accident, but it creates a lot of headaches. So having a camera to register a vehicle for test will eradicate a lot of issues. Um, and speed up the test a little bit as well. And equally with a camera, you can then start doing lots of things. It can protect the tester. So when the, an image of a vehicle is taken, you can s clearly see that it, the condition of that vehicle, it, you know, it didn't have that, you know, those, those wheels on it for argument's sake or whatever, or it was a different color. Um, all that sort of information can be stored and then used, um, used for, for good and bad, I guess, in, in the future. So these are the kind of things we're looking at going forward for the test and evolution to try and try and keep pace with these vehicles, I must admit. And, and that's, you know, we're talking a few years away yet, we're not talking tomorrow, um, but it's all steps we're trying to take to, to evolve the test in a pragmatic and cost-effective way for everybody. Brilliant, thanks, Chris. We've got five minutes left. I apologize for my uh, dog in the background. I hope it's not putting everyone off. Um, th we've got, uh, there's a question here from Lee, which we should take, um, uh, but, um, uh, the final question. Oh, it just disappeared on me. Um, but if anybody else has uh, any questions, specific questions they want to put to the panel now, now is the time with a few minutes left. I should say also at this point, the next edition of IMI's Motor Pro magazine is a special MOT edition. So a lot of the things that Chris was talking about there, about future trends and future challenges, uh, for um, testers and you know the changing shape of the marketplace is being covered in the next edition of Motor Pro. So keep your eye out for that. It's really, really, really good story. So um, uh, just flagging that up with you. Um, any um, that last question from Lee there has, has disappeared for me too, but it was a really interesting one, and I'm, I'm sure it's one that um... I don't know why it disappeared. I I typed a response and hit send. Okay. Excellent. Uh, can I you can it, that's made it disappear? No, I don't <laughs> Simon, <laughs> Simon, to the best of your knowledge, Simon, remind us of what Lee's question was, and we'll we'll take it again publicly. Do deviate? Do we uh, re retrieve the results of the amount of failures and sort of why we do that? So the answer is yes. We do get the number of failures and the percentage mark from the Warren organisations. It's then it's pumped into MTS. It's not done for anything to catch anything out. It's done for our own benefit so we can assess the severity or impact that the assessment's having. So it's not about always making it harder. Yes, um, so we look at the data, how many people are failing, what's the reason for it? So it, it's, it's to make things better and improve the assessment of, that data, of, of getting that data of the number of fails. It's not just about, it's not good. We, we don't get it to go out and target test to say this test has failed X amount of times and the rest of it. It's purely data driven for us to, to, to assess how many people are failing and for us to adjust the assessment next year, if needs be. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. A uh, bit of concern about Big Brother watching you, Chris, with, uh, you know, cameras in the test station. Um, uh, I wanted to take Haley's question um, about the search functionality for the guide. Um, she's not found it as easy to use as the manual, and will there be further search functionality for the guide in the future? Well, you can, you can search now by control F on the guide, but um, which is, I know is a bit clunky, it doesn't always take you to the right place, but what we are trying to do at the minute is, it's a bit technical, but the, the current manual is what we call a HTML version where you can link directly to the right bits of the, of the manual. Uh, we're doing the same thing with the guide actually now, that's trying to be rewritten into that format to make it easier to navigate. So we can then put links into the right pages. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, control F will, will, and, a, and a search will find, you put in a keyword that'll take the right part, right area of, of, of the manual 
today if you need if you need be. Um, does that answer the question? Sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm... I, I think so. I mean, Haley, if uh, if you want if you want to uh, ask a supplementary, then please put it in the Q and A. Um, let's uh, take John's question. Is it true that if you fail your assessment, that you will be suspended from testing and that you will have to retrain? I mean, it's a fundamental question. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, we're just going on to Simon's point. I wasn't to say. I mean, we do we do track. You know, we do see people are fair. Just, just to the extreme, we saw there was one tester that had taken the assessment 15 times on the banks the other yeah. day. And that's kind of not in the spirit of things in some ways. Yeah. That they failed every time in some ways. And, and you know, it's okay if you want to take it 15 times, but you know, after the third or second time, I would think I'd have gone away and done some training. Um, yeah. before I could go. Um, so yeah, um, that's probably where we where we should be at. But yeah, if you do fail it and you click over the time frame like Graham opened up with, then yes, you'll be suspended from testing and you've got to take ne next year's assessment. So um, yeah, that's yep, really yep, dems dems the rules. Um, great. Well, look. Oh no, we've got another question. Oh, Haley's come back. Yeah, the metadata has significantly improved the functionality of the manual. Uh, perhaps this could also be applied to the guide to find the right area quickly. Appreciate this might be difficult in the different digital formats of both resources in their current state. Yeah, so that's the aspiration when we we'll, we'll move the guide yeah. to the in format as the manual and it will make searching a lot easier. Um, yeah, bear with us, Haley, we'll get there. Sooner rather than later, I hope on that one. It, in, interesting follow-up point from Nigel as well there. Um, so the search functionality relies on a correct spelling in the guide, whereas in the manual, it allows a little bit of leeway for misspelling. Yeah, it's the same same issue, I think, actually. So the, the, the manual is on this nice new format, which allows for kind of like, uh, um, what's the search term? Like world cards, if you like, you type it slightly wrong in, it, in, the, in the, like Google does, it get, kind of guesses for you. And that's what where the same search will be applied to the to the guide eventually as well. When we move. And the reason why I mentioned it, I'm just conscious of that comment that was made earlier about about dyslexia. So clearly yeah. that could have an impact there. Yeah, no, don't ever read any of my documents. It's all read normally until I start going through it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it's a training package, though, isn't it? That's, if you get the question, you just copy and paste the, the words out of the question. It's not a case of typing up from your own memory. It's, you can just copy and paste the question into the search, however, control F or whatever you're using for the, for the PDF or Good. into the manual search as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, look, um, team, this has been brilliant. I wanted to give Roy a last, uh, anything you wanted to add finally, Roy, before we close up? Um, well, I was gonna say, and listening to, if you fail the test today, it sounds like you're not gonna be stopped from testing tomorrow. So do the training and take the test because if you fail it on the 30th of April, then you will. So for the people that are scared of failing, do the training, take the test now while you've still got a month and a half. And that, that night nicely brings it back to the point we opened with, isn't it? Get this done early. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, um, this has been great. And I hope uh, everyone who's attended today has found it useful. Um, yeah, Chris and Simon, thanks a lot for, for giving all your time and, and you know, putting yourself out there for, 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 question, for taking questions. We really appreciate it. And Roy, you know, brought so much experience and expertise. expertise. We really. But MOTs wouldn't be wouldn't be the same without you. So really appreciate your time. We've got some useful links here on the screen, which um, we think might help you. Um, we'll we'll make the slide deck available and we'll make the whole webinar available afterwards. And, you know, if anybody does have any specific questions um, that, you know, come to you later on, ping them over um, to the IMI. And then if we need to move them on to our friends at the DVSA, then we'll obviously do that and we'll get back to you on it. But um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone again. Thank you for everyone for your uh, for your questions. It's been really good fun. And I hope you found it useful and um, have a good rest of the day and uh, good luck with the assessment um, in the next couple of days when you complete it. I'm, I, hope, I hope this has encouraged you to uh, crack on with it uh, as soon as possible. Anyway, thanks very much to everyone and uh, have a great rest of the day and 
thanks to all our guests as well. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.